Thomas Smale. Thank you for joining me today on Acquiring Minds. Hey, Will. Thanks for having me on. Thomas, you're the founder and CEO of FE International. FE, as it's often called, is a broker of digital businesses. It's been around for 12 years, quite a long time in internet years, and in that time has sold over a billion dollars in digital businesses on behalf of clients. So, Thomas, you've been involved in countless acquisitions of e-commerce businesses, content and affiliate businesses, and SaaS businesses. And today we're going to focus on the latter of those, SaaS. I want to treat this conversation as a primer on buying SaaS businesses from the perspective of an individual acquisition entrepreneur who's really the Acquiring Minds audience. SaaS is often touted as among the most enviable business models around. So we're going to get into why that is. But before all of that, let's do an intro. Thomas, if you would, a quick bio on yourself and on FE, if you would. Sure. Well, yeah, thanks so much for the introduction. So uh, I founded FE International in 2010. Um, I, at the time, was at college. I just graduated that year. And for those of you who remember, it was not a particularly good year to graduate from an economic perspective. There weren't that many jobs. Lots of um, investment banks, which was kind of the industry I was looking to go into, uh, were rescinding job offers for graduates. So I thought I would go and, I guess, essentially have a go at launching a business and see how that that went. Um, I've been spending a couple of years at college uh, buying and selling domain names, websites. So I started to get into, I guess you call it like technology industry, like learning a little bit how it worked. Um, but as a student, I didn't really have any money. So I was buying and selling websites for say a hundred dollars or put it on a credit card. And then at the end of the month, I would sell it for $500 uh, and then pay off the credit card and, and do the same again. Um, mm. So back then, obviously it was a very different business to what it is, is now. Um, but what I found is that the, I guess the concept of buying and selling and negotiating doesn't really change as deals get bigger. It just gets slightly more complex, slightly more formalized. Um, mm. So in the year I graduated or in the month I graduated, um, I published a, a course or like a book on how to buy and sell websites. And it was really just my experience kind of turning $100 into 500, turning 500 into 2000. Um, wasn't really making a huge amount of the time. Um, but I think particularly given the economic conditions at the time, there was a lot of interest in kind of buying and selling. People wanted, mm -hmm. to, people wanted to learn about it. Um, so that's what I was doing. So I published the book and I thought at the time, I remember I was selling it for $97 and I was <laughs> 97, 20, 12, of course, $97. Oh, and I was, I was 22 years old at the time. Didn't come from a family money, didn't really have any money myself. So I was kind of $97 and I might sell three a day. And at the time that was a huge amount of money living in the UK. Um, so I thought I was going to make all my money and my whole career would be selling books and, and courses essentially. Um, but what happened, like long story short, is people would read my book and say, hey, Thomas, actually, I have this technology business, which is making $10,000 a month or whatever it might be. Uh, I, I read your book. It seems like you know what you're doing. Can you help me sell my business? And back then, if you wanted to find a business broker or an M&A firm for a tech business, it's worth 500000 5 million, 20 million. There wasn't really anyone that existed. You could sure. go to an investment bank if you had a company like Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, JP Morgan, whatever it be, if you had a $100 million business, but below that, was, there was no one. So that was, yeah. I guess, the short story on how I stumbled into the space. Uh, and then I spent a couple more years between 2010, and 2012, the first two years of FE, doing a little bit of everything. And then in 2012, we didn't necessarily pivot as such, but we went entirely focused on m a we stopped selling courses uh we used to do a bit of coaching at the time you name it we'd probably tried it um and then since then we've really just been entirely focused on m a like you said we primarily focus on SaaS, e-commerce and content-based businesses but a, a lot of businesses that will fall under the i guess the technology um technology kind of general descriptor um and it's really just compounded from there the industries grown we spent very many years publishing a lot of content i've been interviewed on many podcasts spoken at lots of events um i guess as people sell businesses they also talk about it 
So we're fortunate that if a client has a good experience, they will not necessarily go around telling everyone how amazing we are, but they will go around telling everyone how amazing they are with the business they created and they, they sold. And then that gets more people interested in the industry. And over time, as you mentioned, we've done over a billion dollars in deals, worked with over 1200 sellers that starts to build. That's quite a lot sure. of people out there who are talking about the industry. So it's really just compounded from there. And now we have a team, um, over a hundred people across everything we do. Uh, we have diversified a little bit outside of just M and A. Um, most of our team are uh, in either New York, London, Miami, or San Francisco. Um, mm-hmm. We have some r- remote as well. Um, and we're now at the stage where, if you have a say a SaaS business to sell, for example, you, you call us. Whereas ten years ago, firstly SaaS wasn't really a thing, and there wasn't really anyone you could call if you had a business worth. $1 million, $10 million, or whatever it might be. Um, and two follow-up questions. So yeah, in terms of where you are in the market, $1 million, $10 million SaaS businesses, uh, wh- is that kind of is that kind of your range? $10 million enterprise value down to one or half a million? Uh, no, that's just an example. We're going to up to 100 million. I'd say generally most of our deal flow is below 50. Um, mm-hmm. So in the SaaS space, up to 50, we would work on larger deals as well um but it's not like we're selling 20 80 million dollar companies a a year um Mm -hmm. and then we go a little bit a little bit smaller than that generally we don't go much below a million for a SaaS business but occasionally you'll find us representing something a little bit smaller than that so i say one to 50 is probably our our average deal size at this stage particularly for SaaS. okay and when you said you diversified outside of m a into what so one of the things we've done like since we founded the businesses, I've always, uh, well, founded the business buying, selling businesses myself. So that's what my business partner and I've kind of continued to do on the side. So sometimes we've done that. We generally buy one business a year. Um, and I guess as we've grown years ago, it would be, we're buying, we're buying a $500 business. Now we're buying substantially larger businesses, um, running them on the side. Sometimes we work with investors. Sometimes we do it ourselves. Uh, sometimes it might might be a past client, someone who sold a business, they've made $20 million and they want to kind of deploy some of that capital. Um, yes, yeah, so that's part of how we've been, I guess, diversifying or making sure we can offer more to people. We generally run it as a separate business, but at least in my mind, it's all kind of under the same, similar kind of uh, umbrella. And you're still doing uh, the the one acquisition a year? cadence yep we we do about one one per year it's just uh, i guess the average size each year is it is growing so as well beyond that five hundred dollars now i want to circle back to something you said at the very top in the story of fe international um you actually had this posted on linkedin this week or recently you were asking people about their career pivots and you said of yourself i pivoted from teaching people how to sell their businesses to selling their businesses for them. And you just explained to us how that was the evolution for kind of how FE International came to be. I'm just curious, um, is there some bigger insight there uh, that, it, you know, because a lot of people in the online world want to teach, they want to do courses. Uh, you just, you know, that that whole world just is, is <laughs> growing and their courses are proliferating. And um, one of the first ways people become entrepreneurs often if they want to be digital entrepreneurs is by teaching something just like you selling a book, selling a course um, that that trend is only intensified in the 12 years since you did it. Uh, but you chose to get away from actually doing the teaching and just do the work itself. People would read your book and they, they would they would you know, they, they would pay for the education that you were providing, but still just not want to do it themselves. Um, I, I just, I just wonder if there's an insight to be, to be had there. Is there always more money in doing the thing rather than edu- educating people how to do the thing? I think firstly, maybe overthinking the sophistication of the decision I made at the time. I was <laughs> not necessarily a kid, but I was just opportunistically trying to find the thing that would make me the most money. Uh, and to my my or to, like I build a business around quite honestly to, to my my previous point as an acquirer if, if you're willing to put the work in then that creates opportunities other people are not willing to do so I always think with a service like see I run a service business we represent lots of different types of businesses one of the big opportunities within a service business and um, I think one of the things Effie's done really well since we were founded so always willing to put the work in always available not necessarily you can call or office at 
11 p.m. on a Sunday and someone's going to like be sat at their desk and pick up the phone. But we're generally very good at being available. We're very consistent, very reliable. And in a service business, that goes like a very long, a very long way. So I don't necessarily know if there's a lesson to be learned in that, but I think as an acquirer, you need to think about like what you're actually, what are you like good at? And what you're good at might be working hard, being available, being reliable. And I think a lot of people, particularly over like a 12 year time span, not the smartest person in the world, didn't really know that much about the industry coming into it. But if you consistently work hard and you're always available and you kind of do what you say you're going to do, then over time people will start to talk about you. You don't necessarily Mm -hmm. have to do that. I think it's, if you are a naturally reliable and hardworking person, I think a lot of people don't realize how many people out there are not hardworking and reliable. So often you can get ahead just by being yourself and doing a good job. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of people kind of get obsessed over different business models, whatever they like to buy. Yes, I think there are pros and cons of lots of different business models, but sometimes like a boring service business can work quite well if you're willing to kind of sure. put the work in. So maybe maybe that's really the lesson. It's kind of find something that works for your kind of skill set, personality, particularly if you're an individual acquirer, um, and do that. I never suggest to people buying something you have zero understanding of, either conceptually or technically. That doesn't mean you need to be able to do physically every element of operating a business you acquire. But I think it's important to at least have a, a working understanding or have a propensity to learn or kind of find someone who can teach you how it works. Great. Well, in that answer, you, you've you really um, segued us nicely into, into obsessing about a particular business model, which is going to be the meat of this interview, which is SaaS. Um, you, uh, SaaS software as a service, I'm sure folks know, um, is essentially just today, it's just Software, the software business. Um, but th- this SAS, S-A-A-S acronym is kind of a holdover from w- when software wasn't all delivered in the cloud. Uh, and, you know, 12 years ago when you got started, SAS was, uh, it, it pro- the term probably existed, but it certainly wasn't l- the norm or, or as popular or as hot as it is today. Give us a quick history lesson, if you will, on, on, on the evolution of SaaS as you've observed it over the last 10, tw- 10 or so years. Yeah. So I think as you rightly say, like in 2010, I mean, I'm sure SaaS did exist, but if you ask people in the industry, no one was doing SaaS or talking about SaaS. Almost all software was downloadable desktop software. That was basically the vast majority of the industry. Cloud-based was not necessarily completely uncommon, but generally the most common thing you'd have is you'd have a desktop download and then the only cloud element would be some sort of like piracy verifier to make sure you haven't kind of stolen the product or downloaded it from somewhere you, you, you shouldn't. Um, and then that started to really like pivot and transition over the last 12 years. And to your point now, we actually do sometimes sell downloadable software still, so it does exist. Um, but it's way, way less common. Um, things like, for example, like WordPress plugins, technically we would generically describe it as SaaS, but generally WordPress plugins just have a one-time license fee. So they're probably closest in their dynamic to um, kind of the, the software businesses of old. Yeah. Yes, there are some WordPress plugins you might pay for on a subscription, but that, that's not the the most common um, type of plugin most yep. of them might be 47 97 whatever it might be uh, and then maybe pay a back-end sub- subscription for support so that's kind of really how the industry developed is you'd pay a one-time license and then sometimes you'd pay either for updates or you'd pay additional for support on a subscription and then the whole industry really pivoted to entirely cloud-based the vast majority of say like lower end software or SaaS now is a subscription which includes your support includes access to the product includes updates and then i think as you go more b2b more enterprise software it's quite common to pay for professional services and support 
separately, but that's generally because the integration of a software product, let's say you have a team of 200 people, it's much, much more complex than you and I signing up for a new project management tool or whatever, probably don't require a huge amount of thought or service to integrate that. Whereas if you're switching from an existing solution in a bigger company, it can be much, much more complex. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, so that's really how the industry's changed. And yes, you can certainly find products out there now, which is still a, a one-time payment. Um, I think most people, even though SaaS is really referring to the kind of cloud element, um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be a recurring subscription. Almost all the time when people are talking about SaaS, they're talking about a recurring subscription business, usually monthly or sometimes annually. Right. And and that point is probably the the... the what makes it the most attractive element of it is the recurring nature of the software. So whereas, you know, buying something once versus having a, a monthly recurring revenue, everybody in, in the acquiring minds world um, just appreciates the value of, of recurring revenue and in, in business valuation and type of business you might want to buy. Um, so that one speaks for itself, but are there other, what other pros, what, are, what other, um, you know, positive attributes of SaaS are there that make it such a, a desirable kind of category and a hot category? Yeah, so I think one of them um, is really that in a software business, and this does not apply to all software businesses, but in a good software business, particularly if you're selling to businesses, the switching cost is relatively high. So if you're selling to individuals, it's a little bit different. So if I'm just selling a product to you or just to me, if you want to cancel at the end of the month, it probably doesn't really cause any disruption to your business. Where if you have, like I said, like a hundred people using a software product, um, whatever that might be, it might be Zoom is, I guess, a good example that everyone knows about at the moment. If I said, and we, we actually don't really use Zoom that much internally, we use a different product. But if I said to my team, hey, we're all moving to Zoom next month, there's actually a huge amount of work that goes into moving because it's all of our kind of automated sequences, email signatures, all of these things that link to Vonage, which is the system we use at the moment. So we have to move to Zoom, then we have to figure out security settings, loads and loads of different things. So the cost to us for switching, even if the product might be cheaper or even better, is quite significant. So mm -hmm. yes, you have the recurring element, which is great, but you also have the fact that a good software product should generally have relatively low churn because there's high switching costs. Um, so I think that's what makes it attractive as well. Like, yes, you have a recurring element, um, but the way I, I kind of think about it is as an acquirer, or maybe this is my British risk averse nature, um, <laughs> but your number one priority, or at least one of your number one priorities is capital preservation. You do not necessarily need to triple a business for it to be successful, but it's, if you run it to zero, You've definitely failed. You can you can live with a small amount of decline, but you can't run a business to zero. So I think fundamentally one of the best things about a SaaS business, um, assuming the product does not become obsolete, which is very rare. I can think of very few examples where that happens. Even if, and the way I think about it in really simple terms, if you buy a, a SaaS business and you are terrible at marketing, you fail at marketing, you never acquire one more customer ever, that business will still be making some money. And in some cases, the business could still grow because you could have expansion revenue, which outpaces cancellations. Um, so your downside is much, much um, kind of more hedged than it would be in a, um, say an e-commerce business where you're selling products. It could be a really popular product for a year and then suddenly people stop buying it and you're back at, you're back at zero. Um, and then I think there's like various other elements. I think similar to my point about a service business, a lot of people don't want to run a service business because maybe maybe this is not a common opinion in the current kind of job climate, but yes, you actually have to work hard. Um, and like your hours <laughs> are generally correlated to success. Yes, there are definitely some exceptions. Yes, maybe you could be way smarter than me and be more successful with less hours. I'm sure there are some many examples of people who are, but generally hours uh, to an extent and work ethic correlated success in yep. software. It's a little bit different. It's more your I guess technical expertise. So either you need to be able to write code yourself or you need to be 
good at managing and finding developers and running them, kind of managing them in an efficient way. Um, so I think part of it is people like SaaS businesses because they have a bit of a moat just naturally. You can't just, you can spin up a service business overnight. If you decided tomorrow you wanted to go launch an M&A business, you could technically roll out a website and say you do M&A. And if you got a client, you could theoretically run some of that process. Whereas if you say, oh, I have a, a SaaS business, you try to create a, a new version of Zoom, which is bigger, better, cheaper, whatever it might be. And you try to roll that out tomorrow, it's, it's physically impossible. So you also have that kind of technology moat. Again, that really varies depending on the kind of type of product you're, you're buying. Uh, but I think a lot of people like it for that reason. Um, I think as well, the kind of more, the thing that's really made SaaS popular over the last 10 years or so is really just that a lot of the big companies you hear about, companies getting funding, companies having exits are now in the SaaS space. So if you say to someone, I have a SaaS business. So say you say that to a hundred random people, way more people are going to know what that is versus 10 years ago. You said that 10 years ago, maybe two people would know what it is, but now almost anyone conceptually understands what SaaS is. If you give them some examples like Zoom, because almost everyone in the world, even my parents who don't really know how to use technology, now know how to use Zoom. So people will just kind of understand. Sure. Uh, This point about moats, I actually want to chew on that a little bit with you because Actually, Dom Wells made this point when he was sitting in your chair a couple months ago that, in fact, he he feel he felt that like SaaS doesn't have the moat that it would, might appear to. Um, and if you kind of look through the various categories of software out there, project management, let's take as an example, um, or CRM is another good one. Like there are just countless products in many of these categories. And sure, there is a moat there because there's, you know, a, you know, hundreds of developer hours that go into building a good, a good product. Um, but, you know, to your point about the, the service business, just, you know, hanging a shingle to, to open an M&A practice, there would still be hundreds of hours of expertise that I would have to develop, maybe not hundreds, but many hours of expertise that I'd have to develop to, to, to actually perform the service for the client. So there is still sort of an expertise moat in both cases. Um, so I, I just thought it was an interesting point he made because I had thought of SaaS as, as being a little bit, SaaS business as being a little bit better protected than in fact he did. And, and we were having a podcast using, I'm using Riverside to record this as I was with him. And he was like, you know, if Riverside's $9 a month and you could probably find 10 other products out there that are similarly priced, um, that, you know, have pretty much similar bells and whistles. And really take, takeaway would just be that, um, SaaS is just really competitive. Uh, it's it's not maybe as desirable um, as it was five years ago when there were. I, I think also what happened in the last ten years is that there were just a lot of opportunities, business processes, consumer processes, industries that had yet to SaaSify, and these entrepreneurs now have gone out and all kind of conquered that ter- territory. And it's hard to find anything that does not already have a SaaS product attached to it. Um, and so there was kind of a, a kind of a, a land grab that occurred over the last ten years. That if you were first or second in a market, you know, could have been great. But now, now, kind of, there's blood everywhere. If you if you want to get into if you want to get into SaaS, any thoughts on that uh, kind of ramble? Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I really agree with that. To be honest, I mean, I think any bit. So I guess my point about SaaS versus service business is a, a moat in SaaS is generally the technology. In service, it is expertise, reputation, uh, experience. There are lots of things that go into that. So if you wanted to compete with FE International tomorrow, yes, you could spin up a website, but you physically can't buy, regardless of how much money you have, you can't buy 12 years of experience. I guess you could hire people with 12 years experience. You can't buy 12 years of reputation. Um, whereas in a technology business, you can always build a better product. And if it's better, it doesn't really matter how old it is. No one really cares. I guess the nature of technology is people are always expecting yep. it to improve. Um, I think the the way I look at it, like philosophically, is the think about the number of buyers coming into the the market and the industry. There are still so many companies out there, big and small, that still use 
Like they don't use software for mm-hmm. anything. I think particularly living in the US, so I moved to the, as we were talking about before we started the recording, I moved to the suburbs a couple of years ago and we have at my house have various like service providers that come and provide things for like someone doing the pool, someone doing our yard or whatever. None of them use any sort of technology. Our yard guy gets paid by check and he uses text messages. So there's, I think there's still a vast number of industries which haven't moved to software or the cloud at all. So if you're building one of those businesses, yes, it's becoming more and more competitive, um, but there are also still tons of companies, tons of people who have not kind of fully embraced software and, and cloud. And to my point about switching costs, assuming you have the right kind of product or, or whatever, like with my yard guy, for example, I've never spoken to him about it, but I'm assuming he's like, well, my clients reply to text messages and happily pay me by check. So why would I change? He's exactly the same once you're on a SaaS product, unless it's with your podcast, for example, yes, you might be able to find something cheaper than Riverside, but are you really going to bother switching a platform that you know, and I'm assuming you like for $10 a month? In almost no businesses, do they make that kind of decision to change for $10? Individual consumers definitely do. She's look at like products like Netflix, for example, laying off people at the moment because subscriber numbers are down. Yes, people absolutely do cancel if you increase the cost of a subscription from, I don't know how much Netflix is, $25 to $30 a month. Yes, there's a huge number of people out there like, I absolutely can't afford five more dollars. Um, been in software, if you're in the right industry at least, or what I'd consider the right industry, shouldn't be losing clients over five dollars a month so yes it's competitive um but i don't necessarily think that should prevent you entering an industry there are numerous examples of companies that have kind of entered software space years after others and sure. kind of improved on it but i don't know. like years ago for example i think when i started fe everyone uses skype for video calls podcasts it was always Skype. It was a Skype video call. Um, and then Skype got acquired Microsoft. by Microsoft. And it's now terrible. Basically, no one uses Skype. It's almost completely unusable product. Uh, no one uses it. But years ago, you would have, if we had this podcast 12 years ago, like, Thomas, why would you bother launching something that competes with Skype? Because Skype is so good. Skype is owned. I don't think it was owned by Microsoft then, but Skype is owned by Microsoft or a big company. We would probably say, well, yeah, it actually would right. be difficult to right, compete sure. with Skype. But now you have almost no one uses it. People use, for podcasts, for example, it's Riverside or Zoom or they're probably the two main ones yeah. I-, I come across. So I think there's always, there's always new opportunities. I mean, that doesn't mean it'll be easy, but I don't think competition is necessarily a bad sign. Competition really just shows you, hopefully, that other people have spotted an opportunity and to your point about how is FE growing, yes, part of it is we are just getting better as a company, but part of it is also the industry. I spotted a, I like to think I spotted a good industry 12 years ago, which has grown. If you're in the right industry and do a good job, your business should grow as well. Excellent. Let's talk a little bit about cons uh, of SaaS. What, what, um, what are some of the drawbacks? Well, I think all those same points like also reverse. So te- technology is a moat, but technology is also very difficult. If you don't know anything about tech, you're reliant on third-party developers. Maybe you have to hire a developer in-house. Maybe you have to use freelancers. Maybe you have to use an agency. Maybe you need to find a business partner or some sort of equity partner who does know how tech works and can write, write code. Um, so like, while it's a positive, it can also be a negative like things break. It's the nature of software. There's no such thing as a passive software acquisition. Almost any software, regardless of how stable it is, will at times break if you do nothing with it. So you constantly need to have, you will forever have some form of overhead, whether it's yourself who knows how to write code or a team of developers who need to be available if something breaks. And the nature of technology, it doesn't have, it can break at any time. It's not like a, a service business. If you say, hey, I work nine till six, Monday to Friday, and my yard guy says, well, the only time you can cut your grass is 4 p.m. Friday, that's the time you take. There's no situation where I would ever be calling him at 
11 p.m. on a Sunday and being like, hey, can you come cut my grass? Because it's <laughs> clearly not how it works. But in software, software can break at any time. Um, so that is part of it. You kind of have to be aware that if you're buying a business, I think this is something that I think people hear and they understand or they think they understand. But you don't truly understand the responsibility of owning a business until you actually own one, which is if something happens at 11 p.m. on a Sunday, which it will, you have to fix mm -hmm. it. You have to be available. Yes, you can hire a team. Yes, you can delegate, outsource, hire a CEO, hire a manager or whatever. But I can assure you that's going to be keeping you up at night and you're going to be making sure that that gets done. So that's definitely a, the, the pros are also cons. If you pick a business which is either high churn or targeting, uh, say, look, I'll describe like a lower end demographic, a more price sensitive demographic then I think you're much more susceptible to new competition. So if you have a product with a good technological moat, um, high switching costs, then even if a better product comes along, which is cheaper than yours, people will not necessarily switch. If you're a targeting either consumers or lower end businesses, they might, they might switch for $5 a month. They might even switch for, for less than that. Um, so you have to kind of, all of the advantages are also um, disadvantages. Um, and I guess with the recurring nature, I don't know, really know if this is really a disadvantage as such the recurring nature. If you're just selling monthly subscriptions, there's never going to be unlike in e-commerce, for example, there's never going to be a day or a month where you suddenly quadruple your sales. You don't suddenly go from kind of making a hundred thousand MRR to 400,000 in a month. Like, theoretically it's possible, but it's highly unlikely. Whereas in an e-commerce business, uh, let's say it's Christmas or Thanksgiving around Black Friday, around that time of year, um, all sorts of other religious holidays, holidays, whatever it might be, um, there's always a possibility you can make $10 million in a day if your product goes viral on TikTok or Instagram or, or whatever it might be. So it doesn't necessarily make SaaS bad, but I think with SaaS, it's much harder to have, it's less common to see exponential growth then it might be in e-commerce, but it's much more common to see consistent growth, which continues for not forever, but for, for years. And what about the valuation of SaaS businesses the price to get into to SaaS? It's got a reputation for being quite expensive. It, it can be hard to get an SBA loan on, on SaaS because the valuation is so high, the, let, the debt won't support it. Uh, can you speak to that? It's definitely true. Um, we generally find the VAR, I wouldn't necessarily say all, I wouldn't want to put people off, but I say almost all of the SaaS deals we do are not people using SBA loans. People have found other ways to fund them. Uh, because firstly, to your point earlier about more qualified buyers ahead of, not necessarily less qualified buyers, but buyers who do not necessarily immediately have access to capital. The reality is if you're working with any M&A firm, business broker, investment bank, whatever you want to call it you're always going to have priority if you have cash on hand or have the ability to raise capital without relying on the sba um sba is a, i mean don't get me wrong sba is a fantastic program as a brit living in the us um i don't qualify for an sba loan if i did i would also want to use an sba loan to buy a business so i completely understand the um appeal of it um but it is guess being government backed and being with banks it can be slow particularly versus someone who has cash mm -hmm. um so i think that one of the things you need to accept if you want to require a SaaS business is you generally will have to pay a high multiple i think that's kind of unavoidable and if you're to your point earlier about sophisticated buyers passing if you're not paying a high multiple then you probably need to accept that some of the things on your checklist of things you might want probably won't be there so the most common one will be like lack of growth for SaaS businesses not growing and it's relatively flat then you probably don't have to pay 10 times EBITDA which in almost all cases is untenable with a SBA loan maybe you're paying five times which is not necessarily always tenable but certainly could be um <coughs> excuse me so that's certainly a way to 
to look at it as well. Like you have to accept kind of trade-offs. If you want to use an SBA loan to buy a SaaS business, then probably the only way you're going to be competitive is buying a business that other people don't want to buy because it doesn't necessarily check all, check all their boxes. You're not going to be able to buy, I guess I'm not trying to turn people off, but reality is you're not going to be able to buy a SaaS business that's been doubling every single year for the last five years, has a management team in place, has churn at 0.5%. The product has a fantastic reputation. Highly unlikely you're going to be able to buy that business for five times and use an SBA loan. It's going to get bought by someone else. So I'd say where we do see SBA loans for SaaS deals are generally business which are not necessarily older, but they're generally going to be slower growth. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely possible, but I think you really just need to accept the the reality that really, and this is a little bit different from a lot of people that we deal with who are coming in to buy a business might've had a background in, in real estate. I was saying with real estate, the value is kind of, I don't know if it's a bit of a cliche saying, but like the value, your profit is almost kind of made at your buy price. Yeah. How will you do on like what you're acquiring for? Because you can't really, I mean, yes, arguably over time, the value of land should, should increase, but the only real thing you can do to move the needle on income, if it's a rental property is either improve the property physically, I guess, increase prices. If the previous owner has not been charging the right amount of rent, you can't physically expand the land. You can't double market rents in the the city you happen to be in or anything like that. Whereas with a business, the reality is you can quadruple a business if you do a good job with it. So I think if you're going to make a acquisition, so particularly in the current market where like SaaS is hot, if you want to buy a SaaS business, you probably have to accept you're going to be paying more than you are comfortable with, or you might originally be comfortable with. Um, but if you can double the business in a year, does it really matter what you paid? I would always say no. Um, if you have no idea what you're doing and you have no plan for growing it, then I would never suggest, well, buying any business, but you definitely shouldn't be buying a SaaS business at a premium multiple with an SBA loan if you don't at least have some kind of plan of what you might do. Great. Um, and that would be a, a pretty stark contrast with e-commerce. I mean, the, the learning curve for e-commerce is way less steep. Let's say I don't really know. I've never done anything with e-commerce other than buy, buy stuff myself. Um, it's learnable qu much more quickly. Is that a, a fair? I We're generalizing very broadly here, but fair? Uh, I'd probably say no, actually. Really? Um, I think e-commerce at a small scale, yes. If you just want to like learn how to sell a product on eBay or Etsy or Amazon, Shopify, relatively simple. So if I just want to sell mugs, you can find a supplier for mugs and you can sell a hundred mugs a month. I think where e-commerce gets complex when we actually see quite a lot of deal flow is a business gets to a certain size and it gets really complex and people can't figure out how to grow it further. That might be at say one to 10 million revenue i'd say where that generally comes in because you get all this additional complexity that you don't have selling 100 mugs a month if you're selling a hundred thousand mugs a month then you add all this complexity that you don't have at a smaller scale so uh logistics you have to have a warehouse maybe you have to have multiple warehouses maybe you need multiple suppliers the the flip side of it with SaaS is and one of the best things about SaaS is technically and there are some limits but it's technically infinitely scalable. If you add a million users or 10 users, the products should still work. Again, with some technical limitations in there. Whereas shipping a million mugs versus 10 mugs is a completely different complexity. So I think maybe the initial learning curve is lower with e-commerce. But I definitely don't think um, if you're operating, say, a $10 million a year e-commerce business versus a say $2 million a year SaaS business, which is probably going to be making a similar level of EBITDA based mm -hmm. on average margins mm -hmm. off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. I don't necessarily think the SaaS business is easier or sorry, harder to run than the e-commerce business. They are different. So SaaS kind of really have to be good at understanding tech, I'd say is the main part. E-commerce, a lot more of it is marketing. If you're not very good at marketing, probably not going to be able to run a e-commerce business 
and logistics, which can get extremely complex. Um, not impossible, but can get very, very difficult to scale beyond a certain size. Whereas SaaS, it's generally not the generally not the case. I mean, again, I, I'm generalizing, but that's just my experience of what I've seen which, of businesses which kind of hit that kind of revenue level. For SaaS businesses, again, and talking about how competitive the market is, and if you know a desirable business is going to go to somebody who has access, quick, you know, quick to close, access to funds. In the uh, offline world, in traditional businesses, which a lot of my audience is looking at, um, there's kind of a a rule of thumb that if you're looking at businesses that are doing a million or more in EBITDA, then they're going to be th- those are also going to be attra- going to attract the attention of private equity. So. At that tier, you're going to be competing with heavier hitters, you know, deeper pockets, et cetera, et cetera. And um, so you kind of the strategy would be to go a little bit low below that. So, you know, 500,000 to uh, to a million dollars in EBITDA is too small for private equity. So at that level, you're competing with other acquisition entrepreneurs like you, maybe, com- you know, competitors doing bolt-ons and tuck-ins. Um, so it's it's this kind of it's this kind of threshold that people talk about and think about um, in terms of the sweet spot you should target for uh, an EBITDA's business. Uh, uh, <laughs> business is EBITDA. Does such a threshold exist in, in the world of SaaS? Is there an analog here? To, to an extent, when I mean, we speak to thousands of private equity, we're constantly doing outreach to private equity firms to show them deals, get them in our network, introduce ourselves, whatever that might be. And we also get a huge amount of inbound from private equity firms trying to buy businesses. I would say, firstly, if you downloaded a random sample of a hundred of them and looked at their criteria, there would be, I mean, some correlation, but they're not, it's not private equity is only looking for businesses with more than a million EBITDA. You might find some who are only looking for 25 million EBITDA, some who are at five, some who are at two, some who are at one, some who are at 500,000, some don't actually care at all. They're just interested in revenue because they're going to do it as a tuck-in acquisition to other businesses in their portfolio. Um, so that would be my, I guess, initial answer. But I mean, it is definitely true that I'd say a million and above EBITDA, to your point, it, you more commonly going to be competing against a private equity firm. So i say generally when the valuation goes above about 10 million um because at that level there's no sba buyers because you can't get an sba loan at that level um so it's either going to be a strategic buyer a private equity firm or someone who has access to a large amount of capital and it's highly unlikely to be an individual at that level buying for the first time um just because if you're going to be buying at that level for the first time it would probably make more sense for it to be part of the strategic portfolio or, or whatever that might be or maybe you would have started with saying a little bit um smaller uh, and if they are buying at that level as an individual chances are there's a reason why they're doing that maybe they had a 50 million dollar exit and they want to go buy a business for 10 million dollars that would make mm-hmm. sense mm-hmm. um so i would say as businesses get bigger there's definitely correlation with the number of private equity firms you will be competing with um but there's not necessarily a hard and fast rule i'd say similar to Effie is an M and A firm creating a space for itself, uh, doing smaller deals than a traditional bank will do. There are also private equity firms who are kind of continuously coming down market to find deal flow. Yeah. Um, so if you're buying a business for five million dollars, which is like usually about the biggest you can buy with an SBA loan, approximately. Yep. Um, you're probably still going to be competing with some quite sophisticated um, buyers, uh, and they'll say. Maybe if you get to say a million dollars valuation, highly unlikely you're going to be competing with a private equity firm. But that doesn't mean you're not going to be competing with something that looks very similar to a private equity firm. So a group of kind of business partners who have built up a portfolio and they're doing a little bit of a, a roll up strategy. Um, yeah, so I guess that would be the way of looking at it. Um, but there's there's definitely no hard and fast rule of when private equity firms are buying or not buying. Mm-hmm. Well, it, it sounds like if I want to get a toehold in, in SaaS and become a buyer of SaaS businesses, I really, my best chance is to buy something pretty small, unless I'm 
an already wealthy person or already have access to capital. But if I'm a, if I'm a loan acquisition entrepreneur and I'm just really drawn to SaaS, the economics of SaaS and the future of SaaS, I'm unlikely to do, you know, a big two or three or $4 million deal as my first go. Um, something smaller is, is I'll, I'll probably be able to tackle just because of how competitive the market is. Fair generalization. Well, I, would, I would say so. I, I guess from, see, I'm biased because I see of F international, I like think we're very good at selling businesses. We have an extremely high success rate. We sell almost every business we take on. So yes, if you're acquiring a business that we are representing, um, chances are if you want to buy anything beyond a certain size in SaaS, you're not going to be competitive using an SBA loan. That doesn't necessarily mean you shouldn't try. Um, but you're, it's going to be much harder. Um, there may well be opportunities elsewhere. Like generally. The general correlation is the worse the M&A firm or the business broker, the more likely, a, and I, I don't mean to be offensive to your audience, a less qualified buyer. So someone using an SBA loan versus cash on hand has bought 10 businesses before is going to get an opportunity to acquire a business. But then with that, I mean, there's always a, a flip side. It, it, the, the likely scenario is that a business represented by uh, like a lower tier or a kind of, M and A firm who just popped up overnight. Chances are the business they're representing are going to be lower quality as well. Yeah. So I think you just need to accept that if you are going to use an SBA loan and you want to buy a SaaS business, you're not going to be able to check all your boxes of ideals. And that really goes for any acquirer. I'd say almost all the acquirers we work with most take a while. First time acquirers take a while to figure out what they want to acquire, and most of them quite significantly change and usually reduce their criteria over time. Because we get a huge amount of outreach from people who are like, hey, I'm this person, here's my criteria of 25 things. <laughs> I don't actually have the money I'm going to use alone to buy this business. And it's like, well, yes, everybody out there is looking to buy a business with these 25 things. Um, not necessarily that it doesn't exist, but if it does exist, there's going to be literally hundreds of buyers making offers. So I think as an acquirer to be competitive, you really just have to be a little bit flexible and kind of back yourself to do a good job of the business rather than sitting around waiting for the perfect business to come along because highly unlikely you're going to be the only one that think it's, thinks it's the perfect business. Sure. So it'll be competitive. You'll, you, you so see... for example, we, I'm just thinking we, we marketed a business the other day, um, extremely high growth. Um, and we had, think something like 10 bids within two days it was crazy number of offers so if you were trying to compete with an sba loan you would have literally zero chance of yeah. winning that deal and the end bid ended up going not necessarily above our value well went well above our initial indication with the seller of what we thought it might sell for just because it was so popular and the business just checks so many boxes for acquirers like hot space growing low churn uh great tech all of those kind of things and if you look to if you're a buyer kind of learning about buying businesses and you were looking at what the buyer is going to end up paying for this business almost everyone would say in like I said, it's an mba class almost everyone would say oh it's a stupid deal numbers don't make sense can't service any debt but the reality is this acquirer has a portfolio of businesses they've completed multiple acquisitions they don't really care because they know they can grow it there's um, a kind of a mini trend of micro SaaS, both launching a micro SaaS from, from scratch, but also a few acquirers out there buying micro SaaS businesses. So these are tiny uh, businesses, but SaaS businesses, maybe doing, I don't know, $50,000 a year in ARR, less. Um, you probably, these businesses are probably too small for you, for them to even across your desk, um, but there is some market for them. And of course, micro acquire kind of a do it, do it, um, do it yourself platform to sell your, to sell your micro SaaS. Really, that's, that's probably where the name came from selling a little micro, micro digital businesses. Um, any thoughts on that as a, as, as a first step for uh, a first time entrepreneur for a first time acquisition entrepreneur? Yeah. So, I mean, firstly, <clears throat> FE has been representing, I guess, micro SaaS before the word. <laughs> micro SaaS even really got coined. I think a lot of people think they were kind of the first to come up with it or first start acquiring at that level, but 
we've been doing them since day one of FE. I think as FE has grown and we've become more sophisticated in our service, our average deal size has increased, which does mean that the lower end deals we do far less of now. So it's, it's quite rare that you'll find us representing a 50,000 ARR dollar business, um, to your point. I, I think in almost all cases, it makes sense to buy something small to start with, depending on your goals and your like financial position. I think if you're young and you have no money and you're just starting out, it makes sense to do that. If you're a little bit older and you have years of experience, you have access to some capital, maybe you have like a good salary or whatever it might be, you have a wife or a husband, you have kids and a mortgage then you probably need to buy something more substantial if you're actually going to make the jump to quitting your job or whatever it might be to own a business. So I think in those cases, it doesn't necessarily make sense to buy something um, small. The other thing with buying something small, there are definitely the pros and cons. We could do a whole other podcast just talking about the the pros and cons. The other challenge with buying something small is I think it doesn't really give you the reality of running a business because I think at least in my mind where running a business gets hard, where I found it really difficult personally, we grew, not quickly, but we grew to 10 million revenue. And I thought all of those stages are like relatively easy to figure out as you go. Once we got above $10 million revenue, uh, yes, we're still growing, but I find it significantly more challenging. The kind of things you're doing day to day are just completely different. It's all about team growth, team management processes, systems, culture, compensation, um, particularly in the current market, it gets really difficult. Whereas early on, it's a little bit more about like, can you do marketing? Do you have product market fit? Is your product breaking? Um, so some of the things you'll learn buying a micro SaaS could be helpful, but not necessarily reflective of what it might be like buying, say, a $5 million SaaS business or e-commerce business, whatever you end up um, buying. Because chances are at that level, there's a team, you have to start managing people and that's really a completely different skill set and that's often where not necessarily older but people who come from a more corporate background and maybe they've managed people in the past they're generally going to do much be- better with a bigger business where they have to manage people because they've probably done that before and if they earn enough to kind of qualify for an SBA loan that's big enough and they have the down payment that probably makes more sense than to do whereas buying a really small business where they have to figure everything out for themselves Maybe that doesn't make any sense. Um, yeah, so definite pros and cons. Um, I really think it depends on your like risk tolerance um, and your, the percentage return you can have with a micro business could be well, not always, but could be higher than um, could be higher than like a, a much bigger business. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's better if you turn. It's just what Fe did for many years turn $50,000 into $200,000. Yes, that's fantastic as a kind of percentage return. But in absolute terms, if you have kids and a mortgage and you live in the Bay Area like you and I do, that doesn't really go very far. Right. Um, so it's all relative. It all depends on your personal situation, I think. Thomas, from your pool of, of buyers, buyers who actually buy, not tire kickers or people on your list, um, do you see many that are first time acquirers and are leaving a doing are doing a career pivot? They're whatever, doing something else, have a nine to five and they've decided they want to be an entrepreneur and they buy a business as as their pathway to do so? How how Absolutely. common is that in your all, world? All, all the time. So we do over a hundred tra- so we're generally doing two to three transactions a week, sometimes more, sometimes less. But we're doing hundreds per year, or well over a hundred per year. Um I don't off the top of my head know how many of them are first time acquirers, but it's definitely into the double digits percentage wise. Um, and then we have quite a few as well who then keep doing it. Um, so they buy one and then by the end of the year, they've acquired four. Maybe they team up with some friends or investors they know or whatever it might be. And they, they keep doing it. Um, yes, yeah, so it's definitely common. It's not like it's um, impossible for you to do it, but I say it's just, relatively uncommon on the the bigger deals but there's always room for for first-time buyers particularly those who i guess are somewhat flexible with criteria easy to get on with i think often people 
misguidedly believe that the most important thing when acquiring a business is the price or the valuation. Yes, it is an important factor, but sellers will often go with a buyer that they like the most uh, and the one they think might do the best job running a business. Um, and that isn't necessarily correlated with how many businesses they've bought in the past. Sometimes the seller will look at an acquirer who's bought five businesses and say, yeah, these guys have a bunch of money. Uh, they've undoubtedly done a bunch of acquisitions, um, but like, I don't really like what they've done with the businesses. I was looking up recent reviews and people were saying the support sucks. So maybe they're going to like fire people or whatever. Um, whereas as a first time acquirer, I guess that variable is never in play because you've never done it before. So I think putting the effort in, if you are a first time acquirer, putting in the effort to make sure that the seller likes you is important. If you're, tr you think you're being really smart trying to negotiate really like clever terms, um, then chances are it's not going to work if you don't have any sort of track record because the seller's just going to say, well, no, this bigger firm is offering me simple terms. They can close faster. They have the capital kind of like them. They see professional a lot. Of, I think a lot of first time acquirers make the mistake of being way too complex. So like, mm -hmm. oh, here's my. LOI is 21 pages long and we're going to pay you out in these different seven ways. <laughs> Were you done I'm, with I'm your good. thought or are yeah. you waiting no, for sorry. the, I, I was the just, sneeze to I pass? Was, I was sneezing. <laughs> um, Thomas, of the folks who do buy, who are not funds, or sophisticated buyers who are, who have already done this again and again and again. So first time buyers, but those who get across the finish line, is there any common mistake that you see them make either before acquisition or post acquisition to the extent that you keep track of, of how it goes? Yeah, I think, and again, I, I know I've kind of already spoken about this point earlier when I was giving like a different example, the most common reason for failure and this is particularly common with well any size of business any business model is always not doing the work 100 percent of the time don't bother doing the training properly haven't really done a good handover with the seller uh believe and this is quite common with any kind of acquirer believe they are smarter than the seller so they'll say oh well the seller's taking 40 hours a week to do this but actually I think I can do it in 20 because I have an MBA. They didn't even graduate college. Um, that's really common, that kind of like arrogance or ego. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of mm -hmm. skills required to run a business, which you can't necessarily tell just by like looking at someone or like looking at mm -hmm. their resume. It doesn't necessarily tell you the, the, the full story. To my point earlier about like turning up every day, that's not mm -hmm. correlated at all to ed education. Um, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, I'd say that's probably the most common thing. Like buyers who believe they're really smart and don't necessarily need to do the work or believe that a business will continue to do well by doing... So a lot of people think you can do a little bit less work and the business will still be approximately the same. But there are quite a few businesses which can do substantially worse if you're doing a little bit less than the previous owner was, was doing particularly if you're coming into it for the first time, you don't really understand the space. You don't really like know what trends to be looking at or spotting or anything like that. Um, so yeah, I think that's one way to, to look at it. But I mean, there's, Great. I mean, there are other reasons why acquisitions may fail, but in my experience, we don't see it very often just because we're, we spend a lot of time on buyer qualification, making sure people are a good fit. Our business model is not, and that th this is a valid business broker or M&A model, particularly in the traditional off offline world. There are a lot out there who basically only sell businesses to buyers who are using SBA loans. And part of their entire business is kind of the sales pitch and kind of getting a buyer through the SBA process. Mm -hmm. They don't really care how well you're doing with the business uh, post-sale or how much of a fit it is for you up front because their whole process is, is loans. Whereas because we're not doing that, we don't want people to go through a, a process. I also think a part of that, kind of just thinking about that a bit deeper, is because 
FE was not quite a first mover. I'd be lying to say we were literally the first people to ever sell SaaS businesses because we're a relatively early first mover. Reputation was essential. There was no reason, no incentive for us to ever be in a situation where someone buys a business and runs it into the ground. So yes, sometimes that's outside of our control, but we're not in a big enough industry where we can get away with doing that. We relied on <clears throat> almost being that kind of snowball and compounding effect of positive experiences. Someone buying a business, doing well with it. The factory in the middle is like a bonus for us, but the the real incentive is the industry growing because people are successful in the space. Um, mm-hmm. But I say, and this is this is correlated, I think, with really like anything in life, particularly in the kind of working world. Success is almost always correlated with work ethic. And again, I know that's not always necessarily a popular opinion. And it's exactly the same when it comes to buying a business. If you buy a business, you don't put the work in, then you're not going to succeed. Yes, there are some examples where you can, but chances are that's not going to be the not going to be the case. The fact that you you keep making this point um, tells me that there's probably a lot of people who come looking for online businesses because online businesses have a reputation. Uh, uh, for being passive or potentially passive or semi-passive. And whereas in the traditional business world, you don't, you don't hear that. Nobody thinks they're going to buy that plumbing business and have it be passive. <laughs> they, I mean, so, yeah, uh, they definitely can. I mean, they can be passive to an extent. We definitely see businesses where an owner literally works two hours a week. Um, it might be hard to believe they'll actually work two hours a week. The business yeah. is really f- relatively fat and stable. But to my point in that scenario, often someone might come in and say, okay, well, they're running it in two hours a week. I'm going to come in and just do one hour. But it might be that in that one hour extra the seller was spending, they were, I don't know, checking for bugs or checking for support tickets or whatever it might be that you're now not doing. So generally it's doing less than the seller. That doesn't necessarily mean every business you acquire, you have to work full time. That's not the reality at all. But if you're doing less than the previous owner, in general, I think you're not going to be successful particularly if you think you're smarter than the previous owner. I think generally people underestimate what it takes to be a successful entrepreneur and build but well, any business, really. Thomas, we've been going here for a while, but I still got some, some uh, meaty questions for you. Still got time? Yep. Great. Um, Talking about how software is competitive and it's always evolving, so like a particular product, a product within a particular category, um, two things. First, uh, well, I'll just make this two separate questions. First question is, you said earlier that um, you really have not seen or maybe very, very rarely a SaaS product just become obsolete. So it's not going to, it's unlikely to go to zero, um, unlike maybe e-commerce um, or, or other businesses. When I look at SaaS listings online, though, I, I, will, see, I, I will see some software pro- some SaaS software products that are clearly very long in the tooth and are just desperate. I mean, they're just competitors are going to come in and eat their lunch. There's got to be something more than just mere maintenance to breathe new life into them. Um, so kind of square I maybe I misunderstood you or but kind of square that circle for me because I'll 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 um run away from a lot of SaaS listings I see online because the the product seems so um outdated and it's just going to need a, a complete overhaul um to remain competitive and yes it's 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 revenue is not going to drop to zero tomorrow but it's going to bleed away over the next 3 to 5 years probably Thoughts? Well, I mean sometimes that is the To my point earlier, that's the opportunity because a lot of people will look at that business and say, oh, I don't want to put the work in to modernize or improve the product. Um, There's a particularly businesses that are available to buy at the kind of multiple you can acquire with an SBA loan. Yes, it is reasonably common. Those businesses need a little bit of an overhaul. Um, But that can really, I mean, overhaul can mean lots of different things. Do you need to complete, and I'm not a developer, so I might kind of, not explain this very well, but like you need to completely rebuild the back end of the product. You need to completely rebuild the user interface. If you need to completely rebuild and re-engineer the whole thing and move on to a completely different platform, yes, you probably shouldn't buy that business. But in a lot of cases, old software products, maybe you can improve it quite significantly just by revamping the UI. Yeah. Maybe it's a user interface. Maybe you can just improve the 
the website itself. Um, I'm not necessarily a big believer that the, particularly in B2B SaaS, that the kind of website necessarily matters that much, but sometimes it, it, it can do. Um, so yes, that, and that's the difficulty if you're not technical, you don't always necessarily know, um, what it might take to turn that business around from a technical perspective. And even if you are, it might be very difficult to estimate how long it's going to take. It might be like, well, the owner estimates a hundred hours of work to rebuild X. that's now going to be obsolete. It might actually take 500. Yeah. Very similar to my real estate example. If you're not a builder or you don't work in construction, how long does it take to do X? I, I personally would have no clue. I'd just be guessing and relying yeah. on their estimate. It's no different with, um, developers but I say i mean often that's where the opportunities lie if you're willing to put in yeah. like 95 percent of requirers will pass on the business that needs a a rebuild so if you're the one who is willing to do that work maybe you can create a and most sellers are obviously aware that that's the case you're more likely to be able to have find a seller who's amenable to a say a reasonable deal structure but a deal structure which might incentivize them to kind of help you um improve the the product so yes that product's going to require more work probably more investment into tech or whatever that might be but it may well be you can acquire it for a lower multiple so there's always going to be there's always trade-offs when you're acquiring particularly if if you're multiple or price sensitive related point one of the things that you see usually more ambitious searchers often maybe a traditional search fund uh, look for in the software world taking an on-premise sys software product and taking it to the cloud. And so for folks, what that means is going back to Thomas's definition of SaaS or the evolution of SaaS at the top of the, the top of the interview, um, software that is still kind of installed locally, uh, old, you know, the, the way software used to be and has never been um, refactored into a, a, pro a software product that's served from the cloud. And there can be incredible uh, value to be created there. Um, so any, any, Thoughts on that? Do you see um, on-prem to SaaS theses from buyers coming through your doors very often? Yep, definitely seen it before. We have quite a lot of buyers who might, their unique selling point as an acquirer is the fact that they might be a development agency that has access to capital. So they might only look for projects like that, which are, again, the ones that are going to be passed on by almost all sellers, so almost all buyers, um, because they want to take it over and they don't want to have to do much to tech. In this case, there are various firms out there who are more than willing to do that kind of work. Um, so for example, with like Atlassian apps, if you're familiar with the platform Atlassian, sure. they recently, I don't remember when they changed policy, but quite recently used to be able to get kind of on-premise and kind of non-cloud-based apps with them, but they're making that version of their product obsolete, I think over the next couple of years. So every app on the platform is having to pivot to server-based or or cloud there's, there's not going to be an optionality to do it any any other way beyond that that date so in the atlassian space for example there are definitely acquirers who are going around and that's their kind of thesis or that's their game plan when they take over a business i, I would say if you are a first-time acquirer and you're not technical i would my immediate reaction is it'd probably be a really bad idea to acquire a business with a loan an sba loan where your sole game plan is to completely pivot the the business model i would say that's probably more of a advanced strategy um again maybe that's my cautious nature the various people who would argue against me and say no no that's where all the opportunity is but if you're not a developer you're a first-time buyer and you're taking out a loan i would definitely not suggest buying a on-prem software business and pivoting it to SaaS. But there are many people that do, many people that are successful. But that would not be my personal recommendation. Great. Proprietary outreach is something, again, that you see um, searchers, searchers doing, where they're sending out cold emails, looking to engage a, an owner of a business and possibly buy that owner's business. Uh, is that something that, particularly in a market as hot and competitive as SaaS, is that something, is that a technique that you think could work uh, for folks? It definitely could work. I think a lot of people do outreach really badly though. We get, cause we get a lot of like search outreach 
I think a lot of people, I'm not entirely sure why this is. I haven't really put much thought into the psychology behind it. We get a lot of what I would describe as like ego driven outreach. So people will do their outreach. <laughs> what does that mean? And they'll, they'll, like, I don't know, they'll send you like a one pager and three quarters of it will be like their bio. And it will have things like, almost like, I'm married, so I don't really know how this stuff works, but like a dating profile. They kind of like, I like walking my dog. I enjoy reading books. Um, I live with my wife or husband in San Francisco. They'll just give you like a pointless bio of stuff that sellers don't really care about. Maybe they're trying to like build a relationship with the the seller. Maybe the seller will be like, oh, wow, I also like dogs and walking. And I also live in the, the Bay Area or whatever it might be. Um, I think a lot most sellers aren't really interested in that kind of outreach. They want to know like, why you're the one that should be buying their their business. And if if your business or sorry, their business checks some of the boxes you're you're looking for. So I think sellers care about more about in general this is not everyone, but most of them continuing their legacy, building their business, retaining their team, much more than they care about the fact you have an MBA uh, or you like dogs or you live in the, the Bay Area. Like people don't really care about that. So I don't know where this like trend has come from, but I've definitely seen a lot of search outreach where it's really just focused on them as the acquirer and why that why they're amazing. To my point around why a lot of I think sometimes a lot of buyers think they're smarter than the seller. It's like mm. they're kind of outlining all their professional qualifications. And the seller might say that that's not necessarily attractive to a seller. But if if I asked a seller if I surveyed 1200 of the sellers we've worked with so all of the sellers we've ever worked with and said what were the 10 most important things for you when deciding which buyer to go with i would say something like level of education probably would get named by almost none of them um yeah but i think a lot of buyers think that's important maybe that's their in their mind their usp they have an mba they went to a, a fancy school or whatever that that might be yeah um so i think if you are going to do outreach yes it can be effective but you really have to focus on what you're going to do for the business and why you're uniquely positioned to do that rather than why you as a person are great. That's not really going to, unless you get really lucky, yes, maybe you email a seller who happens to live in the same place, happens to have gone to the same college and happens to work at the same company you did or you do now years ago. So yes, that can happen, but that's way less likely. People really care about, sellers care about playing up to their ego and why you think they've done a great job rather than kind of playing your own ego. So that's, I think, why, and that's not just outreach for acquiring businesses. I think that's where outreach in general goes wrong. People spend their entire time just talking about how amazing they are, what they're selling, and they don't put any effort into kind of, learning about what they're pitching and why they're a good fit. Thomas, I want to ask you the kind of standard market snapshot moment in time question about SaaS. And then I want to close it out with sneaking in a couple of e-commerce questions because you also obviously do a lot of e-commerce work. Um, So on the market snapshot question, so what are you seeing in terms of multiples and valuations given all that's going on in the, the macroeconomic climate? I think surprisingly steady um, at all levels, particularly the like deals below $5 million, for example, that, that where they're generally not private equity funds buying those businesses. Those multiples have not changed at all. Like I said, we had a business the other day, loads of bids went well over our kind of internal asking price was, was really popular. Whereas a lot of people would think, oh, the market's, the market's bad. Multiples must have gone down. Not really the case at that end of the market. Um, at the higher end, I definitely think there's a, a few funds out there who have started to pull back or change their criteria a bit. But what that might mean is that previously there was a thousand potential acquirers for a business. Now there might be 750 for that same business. That doesn't mean it won't sell. It might mean you get slightly less bids, but there's there's still many firms out there who are still private equity firms who are still actively deploying capital. Um, so we haven't really noticed a, a pullback in multiples. Um, I think where that is happening is like the public markets, much bigger 
acquisitions like in the billion dollar range yeah they are changing a little bit but they're also generally going to be more correlated to things like interest rates whereas if you are a fund and you have lp capital and you're buying businesses with cash i mean it does matter to an extent but what the kind of fed rate is doesn't really affect you and your acquisitions whereas much larger acquisitions which are more likely to be leveraged with debt similar to your point about can you buy an, like a, a, biz, a business with an SBA loan at a 10 times multiple? Probably not because you can't service the debt. It's exactly the same as you get to much larger acquisitions as well. So I'll say, so far, not really. Do I have a crystal ball what's going to happen in the next year? No. Um, but also as a firm where I personally sleep well at night, we're diversified. We work on lots of different business models. We have clients all over the world, team all over the world. Um, so we're not... If B to B SaaS above ten million dollars valuations come down in the US, yes, that would affect us a little bit, but it doesn't really affect us as a as a business as a, as a whole because we're still doing lots of other deals as well. And your answer to that question was with respect to SaaS, correct? Uh, no, now I, I, ask well, you I, I guess e-commerce multiples, or was that well, everything? I guess I was talking about everything really. Um, some e-commerce has changed a little bit because there was. Over the last few years, quite a few, I think they coined the term aggregators for themselves, but essentially private equity firms uh, with a a fancy name, which sounded different from private equity, um, raised a lot of capital (laughs) and were doing uh, maybe what I would describe as like stupid deals from a multiple perspective, Um, but they were generally not happening through advisory firms. They were so desperate to deploy capital, they would generally be reaching out to sellers directly, persuading them to sell without hiring an advisor generally once if deals came to us they're going to be slightly more rational in their um approach so i'd say again hasn't really affected us because we weren't really doing those crazy deals in the first place we've always been kind of quite steady multiples gradually increase every year have done for the last 12 years i expect that to continue to like that but yeah e-commerce has probably been affected the the most from that perspective um so maybe there are now some more opportunities as an acquirer in e-commerce but again if you're looking to buy a business similar to real estate you shouldn't be having a one to three year view you need to have a Mm -hmm. minimum 10 year view on what you think is going to happen to the business and the industry um so you think you have to be a lot more bullish than just oh i can get a really good deal on an e-commerce business, I should buy it. That's not necessarily the right thing to do if you're a developer and you know how to build good software products. Something you said earlier about um, a difference between e-commerce and SaaS is how e-commerce, you can have these incredible um, spikes in revenue around whatever, a promotion, a, you know, a, a shopping holiday in a particular country or what have you. Um, you can just see an e-commerce sell through just explode very, very quickly. Um, that also, I think, indicates how, why e-commerce businesses can grow to the size that they do sometimes very, very quickly. So not just necessarily spikes around a holiday, but just a lot of growth really, really quickly. So for example, you know, there, there, FE is currently selling a business, a hand tools e-commerce business. Business has $9 million in sales and was launched in 2020. So it's a two-year-old business doing $9 million in sales. And you just, you see this in e-commerce a lot uh, where um, a business is doing millions of dollars in sales and it was just founded like yesterday. Like <laughs> somebody, you know, during the pandemic decided to, to spin up an e-commerce store and all of a sudden it's doing $10 million two years later. Um, how should I feel about those businesses? Well, firstly, it's, if you look at, again, you survey, I don't know, 100 people who have launched an e-commerce business and 100 people have launched a SaaS business, you will find more people who got to a million dollars revenue. And again, it's an arbitrary number, but a million dollars revenue in e-commerce in a year they did in SaaS. In SaaS, there'll be almost no one. And in e-commerce, there'll be a reasonable number because you can, I guess the nature of like the trends and things like that, you can go from zero to 100 or zero to a million in this context. Um quite quickly i think the real thing to think about in that case is yes it's got to that level 
but how sustainable is it on an ongoing basis? And are you able to uh, achieve that your, yourself? Um, or not? Can you continue to operate it? Do you think it's sustainable? And if it's a relatively young business, so generally speaking, that's where the more experienced acquirers are more likely to be the buyer because they might be very confident in their ability to, so the business you're describing relies quite a lot on paid traffic. Maybe they have a lot of experience running paid ad campaigns. Um, so they're very confident. Maybe they can reduce um, ad spend and increase profitability because they know they've done it before. As a first time acquirer, you probably don't have that data or that experience. So it's much harder to make that decision. So you might be more likely to pass. So I think similar to acquiring a, like a, say a SaaS business that requires a lot of like technical changes to get to where it needs to be similar to relatively young businesses I think you really need to know what you're looking at to make a decision on acquiring that kind of business but it doesn't necessarily mean it's a a bad thing like buying a business like old is not necessarily good and young is not necessarily bad it really depends some people would say well the young business is better because it's still got more untapped opportunities um mm -hmm. and you can kind of argue I think the ongoing trend we probably noticed in this interview is like you can kind of make arguments for either side at any any time and the the pros and cons of what something being a pro can also be a con depending who's looking at it let's end on that on that note of uh, the subjectivity of all of this thomas uh what's the what would you like my audience to do should they go to fe international and subscribe to listings what what what's a, is there a call to action here for you Sure. Yeah. I mean, if you're looking to buy a business, go to the FE website. Um, we, we segment people by business model generally, but you can also inquire on all business models. If you are actively looking to buy a business, I would encourage you to inquire uh, and speak to my team. We'll get your criteria on file, get an idea what you're looking for, and then we can start sending you, you businesses. And I think if you listen to some of the things we've spoken about today, I think that puts you ahead of 98% of searchers who don't really put the effort into kind of learn a tool they just think they're going to do it their their own way um so if you've listened to this podcast and you found us in the first place then you're already ahead of quite a lot of people from the fact you've done that Great. um so just start looking i also say as an acquirer you should never feel rushed into making your first acquisition that doesn't mean you should procrastinate for five years looking um but i say it's very common for first-time acquirers to spend say a year looking or like browsing and then making a decision or not necessarily making a decision on a particular business, but figuring out what their criteria should be. So maybe you start out looking for an e-commerce business and you decide, Hey, actually you should buy a SaaS business. Or maybe you start looking for a SaaS business and say, actually, no, I'm going to buy a service business. There's, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no business model you should buy or shouldn't buy. I would encourage you to start relatively broad and then get narrower with your criteria once you figure out what you like and what you don't like and are you on twitter thomas or should people connect with you on linkedin personally yep twitter twitter and linkedin active on on both you can find me in some other platforms as well but i'd say i'm like daily active on linkedin and twitter great and it's thomas smell pronounced uh, spelled s-m-a-l-e of course all of this will it, be in the show notes as well yeah exactly Thomas, thanks for giving me so much of your time. Fascinating conversation. Really appreciate it. Cool. Thanks, Will. Appreciate it.